What's good, family? Listen, the service just ended. And I want you to know that heaven and earth kissed right here in the church sanctuary today. Listen, we concluded our series entitled All the Way In. Today's message was entitled One Day at a Time. And one of the things that God is trying to do is he's trying to get us uh, to stop worrying about future concerns, stop being worried about what happened yesterday, but to just live in today. This is a critical word for your growth. So do me a favor, don't watch it by yourself. Get a family member, get a coworker, get your girlfriend, get your boyfriend, get your husband, your wife, get your kids. Man, let's watch this word together. Do not keep it to yourself. So listen, I want you to sit still, meditate on it, and remember God wants us to live one day at a time. All right, are we ready for the word today? So do me a favor, stand to your feet as we get ready to go into the scriptures this afternoon. So we're going to go two places in the Word. We're going to begin at, Rome, at Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4. And if you don't mind, put your finger over in Exodus chapter 16. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4. When you get there, let me just hear you say, Pastor, I'm ready. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4. And let me ask you this, how many of us have a need that only God can supply? Anybody else? I, I want to preach to anybody that's kind of worried, preoccupied, anxious about provision. I need somebody to be reminded and to leave convinced that your God knows your need. Your need is on his agenda and it will be meted out in time. Are y'all with the pastor today? Romans 15 and verse 4, and then I want you to put your finger over in Exodus 16. Again, Romans 15 and verse 4, Paul says this, for whatever things were written before were written for our what? Learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? That we might have hope. Now go with me over back to the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 16, and we will begin together at verse number 1. Exodus 16 and verse 1, second book of the Bible. Exodus 16 and verse number 1, when you get there, just say, Pastor, I'm ready. Exodus 16 and verse 1. The Bible says, And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of what? When we had sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with what? Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and they shall and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaints against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? And also Moses says, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full. And the Lord hears your complaints, which you make against who? The complaint is not against Moses and Aaron. The complaint is against who? The complaint is against God. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses spoke to Aaron and uh, saying, say, say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. Now it came to pass as soon as, uh, uh, came to pass as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold 
the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And so it was that quails came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, this is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, one omer per person, according to the number of persons, and let every man take for those who are in his tent. Then the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, and some less. And when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no what? And every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, let no one leave any of it until what? Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and it stank. And Moses was angry with them. So they gathered it every what? Morning every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, the word says that it melted. Today, saints, I want to talk to you for a little while under the subject, we got to live one day at a time. One day at a time. Let's pray together. Father, I am praying that in the hearing of the word, that faith would be multiplied in real time. Holy Spirit, would you simply overwhelm this service with your presence? And Lord, I pray for the soul that is heavy, the soul that is discouraged, the soul that is anxious. Lord, that the spirit of heaviness would be broken up through the power of your word. So Lord, would you hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let those who believe say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, talking to you under the subject one day at a time. You know, family, as we continue to grow and mature, we've got to develop some beliefs or convictions about God's faithfulness in the area of provision. In fact, it is the tension around provision that literally touches every believer in the church. In fact, the greatest tension of our faith is actually how we're going to make it from one month to the next. In fact, some of us can't even pray with focus because we're worried about how the bills are going to be paid. There are some that don't really give to God's cause because we're not sure that God is able to make up the difference. In fact, some can't even enjoy what God has provided today because our minds have run ahead and attached itself to some future concern. And that's why Romans 15, 4 says that everything written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance in the Scriptures, we might find encouragement and have hope so that the things that happened to Abraham and Isaac and Moses were designed to teach us what to do when we face similar adversities in our time. And it is imperative that we understand the Scriptures because too many 
many of us are trying to figure out faith in real time. We're trying to decide whether or not God can be trusted. We develop faith through trial and error, and it's an errant approach because it suggests that the journey of faith begins with you. And this is why we've got to change the way that we read the Scriptures, because the Scripture is not a story about great people who do great things for God. The Scripture is about a great God that does great things even for undeserving people. And see, this is why the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, so that your faith isn't going to be steadied by your experience. Your faith is going to be steadied by what you study. Let me say it again. That your faith isn't going to be anchored by what you go through. Your faith is going to be anchored by the promises of the Word. And see, this is why we've got to get back to committing the promises of God to memory. Because how many of us know that the Scripture is essentially God's resume? It is the history of His interactions with man. And when you read his resume, you'll be daily reminded that God is faithful. In fact, friends, you need to open up the Word and begin looking at some of the promises. You need to read Ezekiel 12 and 25, where God says, my word that I speak, it shall come to pass and it will not be delayed. Somebody needs to read Jeremiah 32, 27, where God says, I am the God of all flesh. And he says, there is nothing too hard for me. Somebody needs to read Isaiah 55 that says his word won't return to him void, but it'll accomplish what he pleased and prosper in the thing that he sent it to do. Somebody out of Google, Joel 2.25, for you serve the God that restores the years that the locusts have taken, and he can rebuild the harvest that the canker worm have eaten. Somebody out of Google, Philippians 4. 419, for it says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Somebody ought to read Psalm 37, where David says, I was young and now I'm old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging after bread. Has anybody read Matthew 7, where he says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and it shall be found. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Is there anybody that believes the promise of Titus that God is not a man that he should lie, nor like the son of man that he should change his mind. I love what James says about the Lord, that in him there is no shadow of turning or variation. I need somebody to know that you've got to stop sitting on the premises and start standing on the promises for all of his promises. In him are yea, and in Christ they are amen. Can you say amen today? And so, friends, as we unpack this word today, I want to talk to you about the faithfulness of God as the one who provides. And there are four principles I want to espouse. The first thing this story teaches, friends, is that you can't solve problems before they arrive. Let, let, let me say it again, that you can't worry about problems before they arrive. Are y'all still with the pastor today? Now, it's crazy because I used to look at this text, my friends, assuming that their fear or their complaints was somewhat justified. In fact, on the surface, it actually looks like their complaint is actually a response to current hunger. But when you look at the Scripture, friends, they're actually about 30 days outside of the land of Egypt, and scholars teach us that that Moses taught them to bring at least 40 days of supply. Are y'all with me? 
Now, now what heightens their anxiety, friends, is that they leave the land of Elam. Now, understand that Elam is described as having 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And so, as long as they were in Elam, there was an abundance of water. The vegetation was plenteous, and there were creature comforts in the land. But now, as they begin their sojourn, the water is now scarce, the vegetation is scarce, and the mirages are many, and they're not sure what parcel of land is going to feed them. And I need somebody to get this truth, because I need you to get that when they begin their complaint, I actually believe that there's already a deficit of food, but the truth is that when they begin their complaint, they actually have about 10 days of provision left. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? In other words, friends, I always thought that their hunger was overwhelming them and their kids, but they're complaining about a problem that has yet to come to pass. In fact, look at this statement here in Patriarchs and Prophets. I want you to read this with me quickly. Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets that they, Israel, were unwilling to trust the Lord any further than they could witness the continual evidence evidence of his power. In other words, they would not trust him beyond the current miracle. Are y'all with me today? And then that she says, Through, though, though their present needs are supplied, many are unwilling to trust God for the future, and they are in constant anxiety, lest poverty shall come upon them and their children shall be left to suffer. Some are always anticipating evil, so that their eyes are blinded to the many blessings which demand their gratitude. And see, this is why, friends, we've got to learn how to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against a knowledge of God. Because if you don't manage your fears, your fears will move you out of the realm of faith. Are y'all with me today? And see, I need y'all to get the absurdity of this scenario, saints. They're complaining about hunger while they're sitting down eating food. They're worried about their kids dying when their kids are running around the campfire. They're anticipating poverty while their bags are filled with the riches that have been supplied from Egypt. In other words, they are contemplating lack when all of their needs have been met and God has never allowed them to lack in a single area of their lives. And I guess what I'm saying, friends, is that if you're going to survive the journey of faith, faith, how many of us know you can't worry about problems before they arrive? Because if you're not careful, your anticipated agony will drive you out of the realm of faith. And let me be clear, friends, that this is not a call to irresponsibility or indifference to the obligations that you have. But what I want to do is I want to give somebody permission to have peace about the present. Okay, let me preach to somebody on this side. I want to give somebody the permission to have peace no matter what uncertainty you are facing in your life. And see, the problem with us is that we're so used to being stressed and overwhelmed that for some to have peace feels irresponsible. We feel like I need to be stressed about something in order to be on top of things. But I'm just at a place where I'm not irresponsible, I'm not indifferent to my obligations, but I'm learning to be still and let God be God and have peace in every present circumstance. And see, friends, this is a call away from ruminating and being overwhelmed over things you cannot control. In other words, friends, you don't need to worry about the future because God hasn't given you power over the future. In fact, let me amend that to edit. Not only did he not give you power over the future, he's not even giving you power over the present. 
In fact, that's why Jesus taught us to live one day at a time. He says, don't even worry about the troubles of tomorrow because sufficient are the troubles of today. Are y'all with me, friends? And see, one of the things I've learned is that God is not going to give you strength for tomorrow today. He's only going to give you strength for today, today. And then like the manna, you've got to get a renewed portion on tomorrow. So let me say it this way. If God is not going to advance tomorrow's strength, stop letting the devil lend you tomorrow's stress. Okay, let me, let me preach to you all on this side. If God isn't going to advance tomorrow's strength, stop letting the devil lend you tomorrow's stress. You need to walk in the strength that God has provided this very day. And what I want to just simply say to somebody is instead of obsessing about tomorrow, instead of meditating on three weeks from now, I want to encourage you to wake up like the psalmist and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Is there anybody that can say that from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, that the name of the Lord is to be praised? I want to call somebody to get to a place where you learn how to wake up and give God a today praise. In other words, I don't know what's going to be with the job three weeks from now, but praise him that you got to go to work today. You don't know where the marriage is going to be in a year, but if you still married, praise him for today. You don't know what's going to be in the fridge a week from now, but if you got food in the fridge, praise him today. And what I'm saying is you don't have to wait until it works out to praise him. You've got to learn how to praise him for what he's doing right now and today. And it's crazy because the, the enemy had stirred them so that even though God had provided for that day, they had already moved into the worst case scenario. They see themselves dead. They see their kids dead. They live in the worst case scenario. And one of the things I want to encourage you to do, beloved, is you got to be mindful to rein in your emotions. Because how many of us know I'm telling the truth? If you're not careful, you'll live in your worst-case scenario. You, you already see yourself contracting such and such. You can already see yourself being evicted. You've already accepted the fact that I'm going to get sick the same time every year. You live in the worst-case scenario. And it's crazy because some of us only have faith for the curses of men. But we have no faith for the blessings of God. It's crazy. I mean, some of y'all know that I guess about a year and a half ago, man, I, I had a bout with Bell's palsy. And as it relates to health things, there are a lot of things that can be a whole lot worse. But man, it causes your face to be disfigured. It causes your speech to slur. And it's crazy because, man, when your speech slurs, it's kind of the worst things that can happen to a speaker. Are y'all with me what I'm saying? And it's crazy because, man, as I'm meeting with my doctors, they literally say, man, you pretty much got a 90% chance to be able to get back to full health, but there's about a 10% chance that you might not regain all of your speech or you may still have some disfiguration. And it's crazy because for a minute, man, I'm living in my worst case scenario. I'm wondering what I'm going to do if I can't talk, if I can't appear on camera, if I can't do what God is telling me to do. But I need you to know that God had to, had to help me regain myself. I had to come to myself. And instead of walking in the 10%, I had to lay claim to the 90%. So guess what? I preached that following Wednesday. I preached that next Sabbath. And like the 10 lepers, as I went, I got stronger each week and more speech each week. I couldn't live in the worst case scenario. And what I'm saying to somebody, there's a looming medical prognosis. The situation does not look good at home. But what I'm saying to somebody is that before you accept the divorce, before you accept the sickness, before you accept the termination, I'm going to encourage you to stand in the Word. 
and declare I'm going to live and not die. I'm going to be above and not beneath. The house is going to close. The kids are going to graduate. The healing is going to come. God is going to hold those houses together. Your kids going to come back to church. Don't just have faith for the bad. As Jonathan said, you got to expect the great. Are y'all hearing the word today, my friends? Second thing this story teaches us is that if you're going to abide in faith, you got to get rid of your contingency plan. Okay. So I need you to be clear that there are portions of this story that are not going to align with conventional thinking. Do you realize, beloved, that God has not necessarily called us, thank the Lord, to live like they did during the miracle of manna, but guess what? We've got to draw out the principles of faith. So what God said to the children of Israel as it relates to the distribution, he gave them some very unique directions. He says, each and every one of you shall take one omer per person. And see, an omer is essentially uh, uh, one-tenth of an ephah. An ephah was about 3.5 liters. And essentially one ephah or one omer was about a tenth of a liter. And that is what they were supposed to eat. And it was a curious thing because God says, don't keep any beyond a single day. God doesn't let them put anything into storage because it is declining storage that got them in this panic in the first place. So God says, don't keep no extra. Don't put no tinfoil in the bottom of your purse and try to carry it home. He says, don't put any in the deep freezer. He says, don't try to put none in a jar like preserve. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He literally sets up a scenario where they've got to trust God every day for their portion. In fact, God is so specific that he literally says, the word says that when the sun warmed up good, it melted away all the excess and then when some disobeyed God and tried to can a little bit extra, God cursed it and filled it with maggots and worms to the point it was inedible and it began to stink. And see, the re there was a reason that God cursed the leftovers. Because essentially what the leftovers were, it was man trying to create a contingency in the event that God didn't do what he said. It was an overt act of disobedience where they say, man, I got to have a little extra in case Jehovah Jireh decides to change his mind. And see, friends, I kind of get how anxious this would somewhat make them. Because literally, I need y'all to stay with me because before we judge them, we doubt on a whole lot less. In other words, like they literally have to go to bed every night with no food in the fridge. No, don't act brand new. Because we tripping with food in the fridge. We tripping with a car in the driveway. We ain't got no faith with all that we have at our disposal. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And it's crazy because, man, for 40 years, God does not allow them to see any provision beyond a single day. And the only time God allowed them to gather a little extra was on the sixth day. And God would make it last two days to let God's people know that if you trust me on the Sabbath, I will supply all your needs. And what he's trying to teach Israel along with us is that I must be your contingency plan. See, how many of us understand that in the will of God, you don't need a plan B? Okay. 
If your steps have been ordered by God, you don't need a backup plan. You don't need an additional hard drive. You don't need a parachute. If your steps have been ordered by God, I need you to know that God is going to come through. But I need you to know the reason why God hates our backup plan, because when you walk by sight, your backup plan supplants God's original plan. So there are some of us that were about to take the step of faith and go back to school or maybe start the business. But the problem is you kept that decent paying job and you kept it as a contingency plan. And that contingency plan supplanted God's original plan. See, there were some of us that are praying for God to send a good godly husband or good godly wife to help walk with you in eternity. But the problem is you will not let go of your jump off, your cuffing partner, or your friends with benefits. And see, you can't even see God's original plan because you're so emotionally entangled with your contingency plan. There are some of us that want to give to the cause of Jesus Christ, but what we do is, man, we won't give God the first fruit of our offering. We say, I'll return it at the end of the month. So if God doesn't show up, then I got a little something to keep me for bad days. But what I'm trying to get somebody to understand is that, man, your contingency plan, it is an act of disobedience that puts you on the other side of the blessing of God. See, help me, Holy Spirit. I need somebody to be clear that there can be no contingencies in the realm of faith. Listen, and I need you to be clear that God is not anti-savings account. God is not anti-retirement fund. He is not anti-having a little extra on occasion. But what God is saying is that I'm going to make war with anything you create to create a cushion for your disobedience against my word. How many of us in the room today want to live in miracle territory? Do I have at least one witness today? Now, I need you to know that there is no contingencies in miracle territory. Are y'all with the pastor today? Do y'all realize that when Moses got to the bottom of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was behind him and walls on both sides, God didn't say to Moses, this is what you do if the waters don't open up. He simply had to trust God for the waters to open up. When they got to the Jordan River, they didn't wait for the waters to part before they stepped in. They had to step in the water. Then the waters began to part. Do you realize that when Peter walked on water, Jesus didn't give him a flotation device. He didn't give him an inner tube. He had to put all of his weight on the words of Jesus Christ. When the ten lepers went their way, Jesus didn't give them the address to CVS in the event that they didn't get healed. They had to walk all the way in obedience. When Abraham sacrificed Isaac, his only contingency was that God would provide or God would provide a resurrection if you going to be in miracle terrain. You got to leave your backup plan behind. And it's crazy because for 40 years, how long church? 40 years, no backup. 40 years, no extra. 40 years, no excess. 40 years, no savings. Watch this church. Every night, they go to bed with the fridge empty. And it's crazy, because I can see like the first day of the miracle, like when they go to bed and they ain't no extra. Man, I can see jokers waking up at three in the morning. And, and they want to be the first ones out in the event that God doesn't put out enough to get it in front of the rest who may be oversleep. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So for these first couple of days, man, every day they wake up with anxiety. But guess what, man? The provision is there. For the first couple of months, they wake up a little nervous. But guess what? Every day they wake up, the provision is still there. After a whole year, they still have a little bit of anxiety. But every day they wake up and the provision is still there. After two years, they wake up and it's there. After five years, they wake up and it's there. After 10 years, they wake up and it's still there. After 20 years, they wake up and it's still there. After 30 years, 
years, they, they wake up and it's still there. After 40 years, they wake up and the provision is still there. And what God has done, uh, unbeknownst to them, is he has built a history with them so that for 40 years, God comes through every single day of the week. And they've seen God come through with so little that they can now rest with nothing. Oh, God. See, some of us can only rest when we see something. But do I have seven folk that have just seen God work with your nothing? Oh, God. Can I just suggest that if you ain't never been down to your last, you've been deprived. But I need seven folk that have been down to their last a whole bunch of times to testify that no matter how broke you've been, no matter how desperate it got, no matter how narrow the margins were, God still came through 100 times out of 100. You can say, I've never been forsaken. My seed has never gone longing for bread. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And see, sometimes, friends, God keeps you in that season temporarily so that you come to know that He is your supply. Are y'all hearing the word today, friends? See, sometimes God ordains it to teach us to stop worrying about things that are not your responsibility. In other words, He is your provider. God is your Father. And sometimes God uses object lessons that make us comfortable to teach us how to walk in faith. It's crazy. You know, my youngest son who's getting baptized today, it's crazy. Whenever anybody got a child, whenever you bring groceries into the house, they examine everything that comes inside. Man, he, he be examining what's in the pantry. He knows how many juice boxes we got, how many snacks we got, man. He, I mean, he keeps inventory on everything that's coming. And it's crazy because when they were a little younger and they had to get ready to break their lunch for school, uh, you know, there were some juice boxes missing or snacks missing. Man, these guys would get all worked up, man, because they didn't have enough snacks. But like one of the things they didn't realize about my wife is that she was known for a late night or early morning store run. And it's crazy because sometimes they would go to bed with the pantry entry empty, but they would wake up because mama already had it on her agenda. And by the time they woke up, the pantry would be full. And, and what I'm saying is, eventually she got on them about their worries and says, have you ever gone to school hungry? Have you ever gone without a snack? Have you ever gone without a juice box? And what she's saying is, I need you to look at your history before you get concerned about your destiny. And what I'm saying to somebody, it doesn't matter what's there when you go to sleep. You serve the God that never sleeps. He never slumbers. And if you look back over your life, you can testify that you've never gone without. But God comes through right on time. Third thing this teaches friends of mine is that work or preparation is still, that, that divine provision still requires human work. All right, let me say it again. Divine provision still requires human work. So, so God, y'all still with me, church? Provided the manna, but guess what? They still had to go gather it. They still, God provided the quail. And guess what? They still had to prepare it. Oh, y'all looking at me brand new. In other words, God provided the manna but he didn't send an angel with a fork to pluck it up and spoon feed it or hand feed it into their mouths. Guess what? Their faith had to be accompanied by works or deeds. Are y'all with me today, friends? So that even though they gathered, I need you to get this, gathering was still a component of divine provision. Gathering was not separate from his provision. Gathering was a component of his provision. 
And there are two things I want to address because, see, there are some of us that have this mythical faith. It is this mythical faith that is simply mental assent to a belief in God, but it requires me not to sacrifice, prepare, study, work, be diligent. I just sit and wait on the Lord. Some of us sitting here praying and saying, Lord, you know, I'm waiting on the Lord. You know what the Lord is saying? I'm sitting here in heaven waiting on you to move in faith. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because even when you look uh, at pre-sin, there were a number of institutions that God put in place even before sin. Sabbath was instituted before sin. That marriage was instituted before sin. And guess what? Work was instituted before sin so that Adam couldn't enjoy the garden if he wasn't willing to dress and keep the garden. In other words, work was always a part of God's divine command so that no matter how much faith or trust in God you had, guess what? There was no substitute for diligence. So students, you can pray until your knees turn brown about the midterm. But at some point, you're going to have to turn off your device, your video game, tell your boo to go home, get off the phone, go to the library, open a book. All the teachers, can I get an amen out there today? Don't, don't come on test day with no revelation. <laughs> amen. That's the only day you got revelation. <laughs> Y'all hear what I'm saying? But what I'm saying is, there, see, God provides, but you still got to gather. There's somebody, you know, that ain't going to lie. People be talking about, you know, pastor, it's just hard to find a job. No, it ain't. Huntsville is one of these cities where if you want a job, am I telling the truth? You can find a job in this city if you can't find one nowhere else. I was telling my parents the other day, man, there is a Dollar General uh, not far from my house. And I walked in Dollar General one day with some slacks and, and kind of a blazer and a shirt. I didn't have on a full suit. But it's crazy because, man, they were so desperate for people to work in Dollar General. I was just having a buggy with some drinks and some plastic forks and spoons. And right there on the spot, the lady said, are you looking for a job? I was kind of like, well, how much does it pay? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I am. I don't. They say the Lord works in mysterious ways. I don't, I don't know. And, and it's crazy because like right there, the lady offers me a job on the spot, and she sees how I'm dressed, and she says, you know what? Not only will I offer a job, you can probably start as a manager. <laughs> so if you walk in a Dollar General and see me with one of them yellow shirts on, y'all know. But what I'm saying is, God provides, but the question is, are you gathering? For some of us, God has provided you a pretty good husband or wife. But the problem is, you operating on autopilot, are you still working for the marriage? Are you still gathering in the home? For some of us, God has provided the opportunity for education, but are you gathering? For some of us, God has provided uh, for certain uh, illnesses. I need you to know there are some certain lifestyle issues that if we just change or amend or adjust, health will resume and healing will return unto us. But are you willing to walk around the block, drink a few glasses of water? Will you gather what God has provided? Are you hearing what I'm saying? But then we have some that have a mythical faith, but then some of us, because we gather we cease giving the appropriate amount of glory to God for what he has provided. See, the thing with some of us is we confuse our roles. And husbands, you will hear me say this with intentional redundancy. I need you to understand, even though, brother, you may get up and go to work, you may put on your armor, you may go and do it over time, I need you to understand that you are not provider. Oh, you and your feelings. Okay, I'm going to stand right here with the Word. I need you to know that you are not provider. Provider is His name. You gather what Jehovah provides. 
Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Do you realize it's Jehovah that provided the job? It's Jehovah that provided the promotion. It's Jehovah that provided. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? All right, all right, go to Acts 17 and verse 28 real quick. Since some of us acting brand new, Acts 17 and verse 28, because some of us men still walking around talking about how we pulled ourselves up from our own bootstraps, how we are, are self-made men and women. Uh, but I need you to know the devil is a liar and there is no truth in him. Acts 17 and verse 28. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Acts chapter 17. And verse 28, I'm having a hard time getting there myself. Acts 17 and verse 28. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Acts 17. This is what happens when you don't bring your glasses because you're trying to be vain. Come on, amen. <laughs> the word says, for in him we live and move. And have our what? In him we live and move and have our being. So stop walking around talking about how you got up and went to work as if you did it by yourself. Oh, how many of us are aware that it is God that renewed the lease on your breath? That it was God that kept the synapses firing in your brain, that it is God that allowed limbs to follow the commands of the mind, that it is God that has the muscles still attached to bone, so that no matter how hard you work, no matter how creative your vision, no matter how diligent your efforts, I need you to realize that the ability to put forth the effort comes from Him. Are y'all hearing the word today? So it's crazy. Like, yeah, I remember, you know, a while back, you know, before LeBron broke Kareem's scoring record, they, you know, they, they interviewed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and they asked him about all the points that he scored. And it's crazy because one of the things that Kareem said, Lewis, is that even though he scored a bunch of points, one of the things that he credited was he credited magic. He gave a lot of the credit to magic because magic was the one that gave him the assist. Oh, y'all didn't catch that. In other words, even though I scored all the points, he knows that if somebody didn't give me the ball where I like it and when I like it or put it right at the rim for me to score it, guess what? I could not have scored all the points without somebody giving some distribution. And what I'm saying is somebody ought to give God an assist praise. It doesn't matter how many points you scored. It doesn't matter how productive you are. Somebody had to distribute the job. Somebody had to assist with the promotion. Somebody had to throw the alley-oop. The hardest part is not throwing it down. It's putting it where somebody can get it. Are y'all hearing the word today? Last thing this teaches us, listen, I'm almost done, is that you can never be fed by somebody else's portion. So, so God created this miraculous form of provision. So God set it up in such a way where each person was supposed to get one Omer per person, and each person would get one for, if the head of the household went out, he would gather uh, that portion for each individual in the house. Did y'all catch that? Now, one of the things that God did was he says, everybody gets their own portion. So that when you got your plate, there was no need of you going and looking at everybody else's plate. There was no need of you trying to covet what they had on theirs. You had to be thankful for what God had put on yours. And guess what? God, God made it in such a way that if you tried to gather a little excess, guess what? It was going to mold and rot out. It was going to stink because he was not going to allow the strong to create a manna empire where the strong survived at the expense of the weak. And this is how you know God is not Republican. <laughs> 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 
He didn't let 1% get 70% of the man. Oh, y'all, I'm still. <laughs> Amen. I'm not Republican or Democrat. I'm independent. Amen. That's in the best. <laughs> But nobody was fighting over their portion. They had to get their portion and be glad with it. Under God's government, guess what? There are no big eyes, no small use, no hierarchies. There were nobodies that, there were no haves and have nots. God made sure that there was enough provision so that everybody had some. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And you know what you did had to do? Is once you ate your portion, God set it up in such a way, man, I don't know if you caught the little miracle embedded in the thing, where he says, man, if somebody, man, gathered too much, it would, it would rot. And if somebody gathered too little, God would make up the difference. <laughs> so literally, not only did God provide it every day, man, if there were, you didn't get enough on your plate, God literally multiplied it as you ate it. So that you would be satisfied with the portion that you had. And simply what I want to say, beloved, is before I get ready to take my seat, because I need you to know that in this particular miracle, God essentially models two of the Ten Commandments. He says, gather a double portion on the sixth day so you can rest on the seventh day. So God models, guess what, the fourth commandment about Sabbath or rest, trust in God. But then in this miracle, you know what he literally teaches the children of Israel to do? Not to covet that which belongs to your neighbor. Because he's saying, if you just, and it don't matter, and it gets it, God said, it didn't matter if you was the first one out or whether you was the last one there, guess what? There was still going to be enough for you. Okay. Let me say it again. It didn't matter if you got there first. It didn't matter if you got there last. God was going to preserve enough of a portion for you. Okay. Some of y'all missed your shout because some of us are so worried about where we are in line that we will worry ourselves out of faith. And I need some young person to know it doesn't matter if you're the first one of your friends to get engaged or whether you're the last one. God has somebody reserved just for you. It doesn't matter if in your friend circle you're the first one to get a house or the last one to get a house. God has one preserved just for you. It doesn't matter if their kids already came back to church. God has a portion of salvation just for yours. Stop counting your place in line and start counting your blessings in God because God is going to reserve a portion just for you. Are y'all hearing the word today, friends? And see, this is critical because, see, some of us won't ever have joy until you stop looking at somebody else's portion. You can't even see the good thing on your own plate because you're so busy looking at what God gave them. No, he literally gave it the same thing he's giving you. Everybody got the same plate. And what I'm saying to somebody today, I want to say to some family, some, some married brother that's looking at single life, some married sister that's saying, oh, single life would be better. When the grass looks greener on the other side, just water your own grass. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? You know what I'm learning? To be satisfied with my problems. Man, see, you're looking at certain folk in church or in your job, and their life looked so good. But you couldn't even walk a mile in their shoes. If you could, you would run back to your little problems so fast. Because you can't tell what people are going through by looking at them here in church today. And what I'm calling somebody to do is to take what the Scripture says in Philippians. To say, man, you know what? The greatest blessing in life is not necessarily when I just have every thing that I want, but when I can get to the place where I'm content with the portion that God has given me. 
So you can say like Paul, I know how to be well-fed, I know how to hungry, I know how to be abound, and I know how to be abased. No matter what situation or circumstance I'm in, I have learned how to be content, and I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. All right, I'm going too long. But you know what the best thing God provided out as he set the 40-year miracle in motion? You know what the best thing he provided was? It wasn't manna. It wasn't quail. Somebody said it. You know what the best thing he provided was? Was grace. Somebody didn't even see it yet. You know how that story should have read. They murmured and complained against God. Oh, y'all didn't get it. You know how that story should have ended, Sister Morton? It should have said they murmured and complained against God. And it should have read, and the anger of God broke out against them and consume them because of their hard-heartedness is how the story should have read. But because God is long-suffering, because He is slow to anger and abundant in mercy, God took their complaint, sent the Holy Spirit to intercede. And what was a complaint? God heard it like a prayer and supplied their need even though they did not ask. And so for 40 years, God didn't just send food on top of food. He sent mercy on top of mercy and grace on top of grace and long-suffering on top of long-suffering. And day after day, he was patient. And day after day, he was kind. And he did not treat them as they deserved. But he treated them according to the multitude of his tender mercies. And see, I don't want you to interpret it wrongly. Don't think that you complain your way to the blessings of God. No, there is just an even greater truth that if God will bless you when you don't believe. See, do you realize, see, even, even, even though God blessed them, there was still judgment in it. So, so part of the judgment was God say, okay, this is what you're going to eat every day for the next 40 years. Okay, y'all still didn't get it. What would God have put out every morning for the next 40 years if they had just said, our Father which art in heaven, we know that you are faithful. We know that you are kind. We know that you love us. If they had just come to God in faith and in prayer, I don't believe they would have eaten one meal for the next 40 years. But every day, the same way God sends new mercies, one day they would have woke up and it would have been steakums. Next day they would have woke up and it would have been uh, links. The next day they woke up and it would have been... chocolates. The next day they woke up, it would have been dinner roast. The next day they woke up, God would have supplied an abundant spread every day if they had just trusted God with the rest. And see, friends of mine, this whole week, as we spent last week and we spent, you know, last Sunday night talking about the celebration of hope, like this whole principle has just been, man, overriding my soul and my spirit to just teach and, man, really drill into the minds of the people of God that we are coming upon a season where radical trust is going to be required. Why am I saying this? It's because, man, we're good at saying, oh, it's the last days. Go ahead and play something for me. But how many of us understand that the surviving the last days is not just about what you know. It's about how much you believe. Because there are going to be some folk that have the right truth 
And, and the prophet already lets us know that bright lights are going to go out. Folk that have been in the way all this time are going to walk away from truth. That's a part of it. But the question is, man, when God draws this line in the sand, and you're either marked by God or sealed by the enemy, and you can't buy or sell or engage in society, will you trust him enough? Or will, like Israel, you're tempted to cling to the known when God is calling you out into the unknown? when he's calling you into that place of radical trust in him. And see, as the old folk would say in church, if you can't run with the footmen, what are you going to do when the horses show up? And see, beloved, what I'm saying, and it's crazy because like when we were in the Holy Land, you know, I, I was really trying to figure out which side of the equation I would be in. Some of us were on the trip. There were times where we get there and it would just be miles of desert. As far as your eye could see, and every time I'd be like, man, I would like to think. And then you know what the Holy Spirit said? If you can't trust me with all I have already provided you, if you can't trust even when you see, how are you going to trust when you cannot see? Are y'all hearing the passage today? God is calling us into a season of radical trust, radical dependence. Radical belief in God. So right now the praise team is going to minister a song. I'm going to make a very brief appeal and I'm going to baptize these souls in Jesus Christ. But, but, but I, want to, I want to encourage you to not just hear a sermon, to not just affirm theology. But remember, Romans 15, 4 says, everything that was written was written as an example unto us so that we know how to handle it when it comes our way. And see, you can't just read this and say, man, that was good for Moses. That was good for Aaron. You got to read it and say, man, I know that that same God is on the throne and that that same God is faithful to me. Go ahead and minister. To trust in Jesus. Come on, church, can we sing that out there? Say, just to. Just to. Someone says, just to rest upon his promise. Says, just to know the say of the Lord. Come on, if you want to trust him today, can we say it together, Jesus? good family. I want to invite you to be a part of a new teaching series in the month of November. We're going to kick off a new series entitled Family-ish Volume 2. 
We began it last fall and we're picking it up again in the month of November where we're going to be teaching on marriage, dating and relationships. But this year we're going to be doing it just a little bit different. Each week there are going to be two services. At 9.15 I'm going to be teaching for our married couples. Then at 10.45 the church is going to be at study. Then there'll be children's church. Then at 11.30 I'll be teaching for our singles and for our students. That's going to be November the 4th, November the 11th, and November the 18th. Again, each week at 9.15, the message is for married couples. Then at 10.45, the church is going to be at study, and then we're going to have children's church. And then at 11.30, I'm going to aim the message at our students and at our singles. In addition, starting on November the 1st, we're going to have a his and hers prayer meeting on Wednesday night. So we're going to invite all of our sisters to join women's ministry. They're going to meet in our multi-purpose room. And then the men are going to meet in Mosley Complex, where we're going to be tackling some gender specific issues and we're going to be built up as a body. So November is going to be family month. It's going to be a great time of teaching and fellowship where you're going to get some tools for living from the word of God. So again, we invite you to join us for family ish volume two. Make sure you're in the house. God bless. I look forward to seeing you then.